Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Nice to be here. Nice to see you. Well, coming to church, I mean, I saw the Christmas decorations and I was like, gosh, I need to do something about our decoration. Um, Rob said, you know, they've managed to put their Christmas tree up. It's a good thing. I mean, if you have young children, um, sit at home, then blessed are you. You know, because they tend to be the drivers behind Christmas decoration. They push for it. Uh, if, if you're like me, kids are a lot older or have started living the, living the house, then you have an uphill struggle. <laughs> uh, maybe the missus will have to give you her wake-up call to get cracking. So... But with or without Christmas decorations, we still celebrate Jesus, and he doesn't mind. (laughs) Yeah. So today is the beginning of Advent, like we know, and this beautiful lit candle here is signifying the coming of the Lord. And we start in a new series we call Come, Let Us Adore Him. Um, let us adore him. And that is the is a refrain or the chorus of a very popular Christmas carol. And we're going to take bits and parts of the chorus to just navigate our way through Advent to Christmas. To explore and unpack and just see this beautiful Savior we are so madly in love with. And as Rob said, the encouragement for all of us is to try and see if we can bring someone to church to hear about this Jesus, the very God who became a man and entered into our world. Just bring someone to hear about this Jesus we serve. And the title of our talk this morning is Jesus, the Son of God, Very God begotten, not created. Jesus, the Son of God, very God begotten, not created. Before we read our text, let me just give us a background to the the, the Bible verse. And it starts in chapter 7 of Isaiah, the book of Isaiah, and it opens up with two countries coming together in alliance to attack Judah. The northern kingdom, Israel, as you know by now, Israel is now split into two kingdoms, the northern kingdom and then Judah to the south. So the northern kingdom entered into an alliance with the king of Aram. Aram is in modern day Syria to attack Judah. And King Ahaz of Judah is petrified. He's afraid. What do I do? So God sends the prophet Isaiah to go to King Ahaz to assure him, don't tremble, don't be afraid. This attempt to attack you, this aggression will come to nothing. So just take a chill pill, go to sleep. That was the Lord's word through the prophet to the king, to King Ahaz. Not long afterwards, God sends the prophet again to King Ahaz, this time saying to the king, Ask me for a sign, anything, a blank check, ask me for anything. Now, if you were in King Ahaz's shoes, with a threat coming at you, what sign would you have asked the Lord? But the king said to the prophet, No, I can't, I don't want to tell God, I can't ask for a sign. So then God said, okay, King Ahaz, if you wouldn't ask for a sign, I, God, will give you one. And that is where we pick up our Bible verse, our first Bible verse this morning. So God himself gives a sign. And that is in Isaiah chapter 7, verse 14. Isaiah chapter 7, verse 14. And I read. 
Therefore the Lord himself will give you a sign. The virgin will conceive and give birth to a son and will call him Emmanuel. It's one verse. Therefore the Lord himself will give you a sign. The virgin will conceive and give birth to a son, to a son and will call him Emmanuel. And as we know, Emmanuel means God with us. God with us. Now remember back in Genesis, following the disobedience of, I like to call them the first couple, Adam and Eve. God said there was coming the seed of the woman. Now, what did that mean? Not very much was known about it. There's the bare bones. So here in Isaiah, God now is beginning to put some flesh on the bones. Who is this seed of the woman? In Isaiah chapter 7 verse 14, the seed of the woman, we're now beginning to know that it was going to be God himself coming to dwell amongst his people. So what I say is, the clue is in the name. Who is the Savior? God says there's a virgin who is to give birth to a Savior, and the Savior shall be called Emmanuel. God with us. The clue is in the name. So the eternal God wants to be born into our world. God to be born into our world. So when we say Jesus, very God, begotten, not created, what do we mean? What does it mean to say Jesus is the begotten of the Father? Simply put, Jesus is in essence as much God as the Father. He's no different. That's just what it means. Jesus is an attribute, in essence, in every way, God, as much as the Father. And how do we know that? Because he, the Lord himself said, said that to us. In John chapter 8, Jesus is having a very heated conversation with some of his disciples. He says to them, the, tr the truth you know will make you free. And the disciples said back to Jesus, now, we are descendants of Abraham, we've never been enslaved. They were making a big push of the fact that they were connected to Abraham. So he went back and forth. And Jesus said to them, This Abraham you venerate and really push up, long to see my day. And yes, indeed, he saw my day. And then they hit back at Jesus saying, What are you talking about, Abraham saw your day? You are not even 50. What are you talking about? And Jesus in verse 58, verse, verse 58 of chapter 8, John says this to them, Verily, truly, I say, I tell you, Jesus answered, Before Abraham was born, I am. Before Abraham was born, I am. Now, Jesus here was not making any reference to a timeline in relation to Abraham, that, oh, I existed before Abraham. Now, Jesus here was saying to us, that he is, in essence, God. And how do we know that? We, we cast our minds back to the book of Exodus. If you remember, in Moses' encounter with God, in the burning bush experience, Moses asked God, if I tell my people, Israel, Israelites, that the God of their fathers has sent me, and they ask me, what is his name? What should I tell them? And God said to Moses, you tell them, my name is I Am. 
And that was the same name Jesus ascribed to himself in this verse. Before Abraham was, I am. So when we say Jesus is the begotten of the Father, that's one of the reasons we say that. One of the reasons we say that. Because he is in essence God come in the flesh. I picked up another reason why we believe Jesus is God come in the flesh. And I've picked up a verse in Isaiah, Isaiah chapter 6. And it's an occasion when Isaiah was caught up in a vision. And this is what he, he wrote in, in the book. In the year that King Uzziah died, King Uzziah was king of Judah, one of the kings. I saw the Lord high and exalted, seated on a throne, and the train of his robe filled the temple. The garment he had filled the whole of the temple. Now, John the Apostle, one of the disciples of Jesus, making reference to this vision that Isaiah saw, which he recorded in Isaiah 6 verse 1, says this. Isaiah said this, and this is in John chapter 12, verse 41. Isaiah said this because he saw Jesus' glory and spoke about him. See, John spoke of the glory of Jesus and made no basic distinction between the two. The glory of Jesus and the glory of God. To John, it's one and the same. Proving Jesus' oneness with God. So when we say Jesus is the begotten of the Father, not created, these are just two of the reasons we believe that. There are many, many reasons in the Bible you can really look for. But these are the two reasons, uh, two reasons I picked to just support the reason we believe Jesus is, in essence, God. Now, Isaiah lived about 700 years before Jesus was born. So 700 years later, after God had given the first sign that there was coming a, a Messiah, a Savior, a virgin was going to birth a Messiah, the time now had come for God to make good his promise. And that is where we pick up our second Bible reading. And that's in Luke chapter 1, reading from 26 to 38. Luke chapter 1, 26 to 38. And I read, In the sixth month of Elizabeth's pregnancy, God sent the angel Gabriel to Nazareth, a town in Galilee, to a virgin pledged to be married to a man named Joseph, a descendant of David. The virgin's name was Mary. The angel went to her and said, Greetings. You are highly favored. The Lord is with you. Mary was greatly troubled at his words and wondered what kind of greeting this might be. But well, the angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary. You have found favor with God. You will conceive and birth a son and you are to call him Jesus. He will be great, and he will be called the Son of the Most High. Well, let me just go off on the rabbit trail. I mean, there's a men's group here. We meet once a month. I mean, we, we, we meet and we wrestle with some of the difficult issues, you know, and our very own Rick very often is in attendance to, to steer us, to help us, advise us, encourage us. And during one of the sessions, one of the lads asked this question. Why is it that in the Old Testament, it was God, 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 and then when we got into the New Testament, it's Jesus. And that was his question. Beautiful question. And the answer is right here. You will conceive and give birth to a son, and you are to call him Jesus. 
Remember, God had already prophesied in Isaiah that the coming Savior was going to be God himself coming in the flesh, Emmanuel. He will be great, verse 32, and will be called the Son of the Most High. The Lord God will give him the throne of his father David, and he will reign over Jacob's descendants forever. His kingdom will never end. How will this be, Mary asked the angel, since I am a virgin? Mary was a young, barely teenager. We're not told how old Mary was in the Bible. The Bible scholars believe she must have been about 13, 14, because back then they married early. But at least she knew how babies were made. How can this be? And the angel answered, the Holy Spirit will come on you and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. So the Holy One to be born will be called the Son of God. Even Mary, sorry, even Elizabeth, Elizabeth is the mother of John the Baptist, your relative is going to have a child in her old age. And she who was said to be unable to conceive is in her sixth month. For no word from God will ever fail. I mean, that, that's a whole sermon by itself. No word from God will ever fail. Amen. The encounter between the angel and Mary, for me, is one of the most beautiful settings in the Bible. The time has come for God to enter into the world he created. And he sends the angel to this young virgin girl, Mary. And watch God's humility here. His gentleness. This almighty God comes down to Mary's level. And treats her with such respect and dignity. You've been chosen to birth Messiah. How can this be? And the angel rose out the proposal, the plan to Mary. And God waits for Mary's response. And that I find so, so interesting. God with all power waits for Mary's response. He doesn't impose a proposal on her. God doesn't impose his power on Mary. He waits for Mary to respond. And what was Mary's response? Amen. Be it unto me according to what you've proposed. I'm with you, God. I'm in on this plan. This is God, who in Psalm 50 says, the earth is mine. The birds in the forest belong to me. The cattle on a thousand hills, I own them. People of the earth, if I were hungry, you wouldn't know about it. And that's God talking. Showing his almighty presence and power. The self-existing one doesn't need anybody propping him up. We need God to live. He's our source. The oxygen we breathe, the rain that comes down from heaven to water our vegetation to grow our crops. God doesn't need anyone. He's self-existent. But when he comes down to the very person he created, Mary, he humbles himself. And that is so profound. Because you contrast that to the way of the world. Where power defines almost anything and everything. Might makes right in our world. If you have it, you just do as you like. Not so with God. The one with all power doesn't do as he pleases. He lays it out before us and waits for us to make the decision. He extends his hand of grace to us, his hand of friendship, 
His hand of love and waits for us to respond. And that is the way God deals with us. That's so profound. And this, this is not in our text, but I can, I can picture in my head Mary carrying baby Jesus. The created holding the creator in her hands. The mystery of it. That when the time came for God to reveal himself to us, he came humbly. Humbly. Gentle, almost weak. And that is God. It's the way love looks like, it's the way love feels like. You see? And God hasn't loved us from a distance. He didn't stay in heaven loving us. That He emptied Himself, as Paul puts it in Philippians 2, and cloaks Himself in flesh. And enters the very heart of the human experience. See. And the question of God, of Jesus as the begotten of the Father, is so crucial for us. Is that probably the most important question that anyone will have to wrestle with and answer? Is Jesus the begotten? Of the Father, all created. Or as he himself put it, when he, he engaged with his disciples one day, who do you say that I am? A question so important that Jesus raised it with his disciples. Who am I? Am I the begotten or am I created? And we know what the response was. Peter just jumps up and says, Thou art the Christ. Thou art the Christos, the anointed one, the son of the living God. And what does that mean? Because Pat, in, in, in Peter's response to Jesus' question, was the dual identity of Jesus. That he is the Christ, fully man. The Son of God, fully God. What Bible scholars call the hypostasis or the hypostatic union of Jesus. That Jesus being fully God and fully man is both perfectly divine and perfectly human, having no, having two complete and distinct nature at the same time. But Jesus is fully God and fully man. And it's important that we are able to hold this thought in our heads at the same time. I struggled with this as a young Christian. Because I didn't know then what I know now. Jesus, God, man, you know, and I couldn't bring myself to turning myself loose in God's hands and loving him and worshipping him. But once you know the true identity of Jesus as God come in the flesh, you love him even more. Because in this love push, God loving us, giving us Jesus who came primarily to save us on his way to the cross. But before the cross, there was the incarnation. Before the cross, there was Christmas. He had to become a man. Paul says he emptied himself, set aside his divinity, set aside his deity, and cloaked himself in humanity. Such humility. And that is the lesson, the example Paul uses in his lesson on humility. So who is this Jesus? As we inch ever closer to Christmas. And I'm just praying that God will give us an additional lens through which we look at Christmas. And in addition to the merrymaking, the food, the string of gifts, 
we see it in another light. As God come in the flesh. See. In Isaiah chapter 7 verse 4 in our first text, God said, the Savior that was coming shall be called Emmanuel. Meaning God with us. Now only God could have saved us. Nobody else. That's why he became a man. And Paul writes about this, and with this I close, coming to the end of my uh, talk. Paul writes about this. You see, Jesus' deity and the work of redemption are so linked. Because only God could have saved us. And this is what Paul says in Colossians 1, 19-20. For God was pleased to have all his fullness dwell in him. The fullness of God dwelled in Jesus. And through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether things on earth or things in heaven, by making peace through his blood shed on the cross. And then finally... The writer of Hebrews 1.3 says this, The sun is the radiance of God's glory and the exact representation of his being, sustaining all things by his powerful word. After he had provided purification for sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty in heaven. Makes you love God. You know, I'm in awe of God's power and majesty. But what brings me to my knees is his gentleness, his humility, his vulnerability. That he, 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 he's conceived and born into our world as a baby. And when I'm wrestling with life's challenges... My mind is under siege and the walls are closing in on me. It's in his love and mercy and in his humility I take refuge. That's why I pitch my tent. Because his love for us is so profound. If he can do that for us, like Paul says, he, God with the same Jesus, is able to bless us with every good thing. That is our Jesus. So as we look forward to Christmas, let's just remind ourselves what it actually means that God became flesh and that Jesus is indeed the begotten of the Father. In essence, God come in the flesh. Shall we stand, if you are able to? In Isaiah chapter 44, verse 6, God said, I am the first, I am the last, there is no one besides me. Jesus, in Revelation 22, 13, made the same claim as the first and the last. What does that tell you? That Jesus is God, come in the flesh. The huge sacrifice. As we celebrate Christmas and the merrymaking, the joys and everything, let's remember this profound love push displayed by God entering our world as a man.